And she has a book coming out next year about the Yarnell Hill fire, which many of you know is the, the fire outside, uh, well, south, south of Prescott that happened two summers ago. Uh, that was a, a tremendous tragedy in that 19 members of the Granite Mountain Hotshots died. So you'll, you'll hear about that. That book will be coming out next year. And on the New York Times website, you can take a look at her coverage of that fire, which started just as the fire was cranking up and when, when that tragedy happened. So she covered the, the breaking news story of that tragedy happening, but then followed up on the fire in, in the coming days and weeks after that, and, and really explored the whys and the hows of, of what happened and did a lot of in-depth journalism. So for the journalism students in the audience, it's a really nice series to look at it, how a story evolves from the day when it's happening and in the coming weeks as more more information about the background is coming out. So I encourage you all to look for that and of course watch for her book as well coming out next year. So you'll hear about that but I also want to point out about Fernanda that um, she's, she's given a couple great talks about um, about how to do journalism and as I as I read her her work I'm always struck by her a couple of pieces of advice, and maybe she'll she'll talk about this. But um, but one is to um, be okay with being uncomfortable, which those of us who work in journalism know is is a common feeling. And of course, it's it's not one you immediately want to embrace. You know, usually we want to avoid that. But she points out, no, you want that. That's precisely where the good stories are. Is when you have that feeling of discomfort. So maybe we'll hear about that a little bit. And um, the other thing I'm struck by is the advice that she gives to always look for the unusual angle. Um, Erica mentioned the sort of a the herd mentality that can come when, when journalists are working together on a big story and you think, well, those other people are here doing it this way, that must be a good way to do it. Um, but of course there's tremendous benefit to going around the backside and, and finding the other angle. And I don't think it is a coincidence that Fernanda has covered some stories that you might expect from Arizona, like <coughs> Joe Arpaio and border issues and so on, and some of the things that Arizona is known for at the national level. Um, but she's also gone to Elephant Butte, New Mexico to write a story about a dog named Blue, which is, which is a great story and what, what a dog means to a, to a small community in, in southern New Mexico. Um, so there, there are great stories like that in her portfolio too that are really, really wonderful to look at. So please join me in welcoming Fernanda to uh, our to think that I need a microphone. I'm usually pretty loud. But, um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I was thinking, you know, that Erica made this amazing presentation about um, her experience photographing. A lot of the things she said are very similar to the things that I experienced as a reporter. I could stand here and talk about fire coverage forever. Not that I'm an expert, not that I've covered a lot of wildfires, but I've certainly spent um, the past two and a half years completely immersed in this world. Um, in fact, I took the, um, the basic wildland firefighting courses with firefighters. I went to the fire academy um, because it wasn't, for me, it wasn't just about learning how to deploy a fire shelter. I was looking actually for the video because it's really funny how hard it is to pull a fire shelter out of a, a plastic box with work gloves on and have to deploy it and, you know, 20 seconds, you've got to be inside your shelter, and um, it's it's really hard, and I felt like a total idiot doing that, but you know, um, I was surrounded by people who felt the same way, so it was fine, um, and um, you know, th there is something about the camaraderie, the teamwork, the sort of uh, companionship and loyalty that you build so easily with people just being in this environment, so, um, but like I said, I could stand here and talk forever, but I, I, I was thinking about, and I borrow Erica's computer, so I'm gonna kind of stand here. Um, I, I was thinking about, I thought that it would be helpful um, to talk about these sort of broader points, I guess. I don't know how to um, put it up there. Oh. Do you know? Yeah. Um, um, about sort of like why some of the things I've learned in my career as a journalist in this country primarily and how perhaps it could be helpful to you guys um, and um, I, I have 
a few slides and I have my stuff written up because I tend to go on like tangents and start talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the topic. Um, so, um, so, you know, I'm assuming I'm in a room that has a lot of journalists and aspiring journalists and I think that um, probably all of you are familiar with the five W's, right? Um, who, what, when, why, and were, and where. Um, and uh, these are the questions that we should, we're trained in journalism school and, and by editors in small papers to answer, um, hopefully in the lead of the story, in the opening of the story. It's a way to quickly and succinctly tell your reader what this story is about. And uh, the AP actually is a, sort of the model for, for that kind of lead. So I wanted to show you guys one of those leads that the AP had for a story that I covered in New Mexico. It was about the beating uh, death of two uh, homeless men <coughs> by three teenagers. So they wrote a pretty straightforward lead. You can see the answers to all these questions. Who, what, when, why, and where. Uh, three teenagers ganged up on two homeless men and fa fatally beat them up, beat them before leaving their bodies nearly unrecognizable. Albuquerque police said. Alex Rios and two boys, ages this and that, are being held in Bernardillo County detention facilities, blah, blah, blah. So all the basic information is there. And, um, um, you know, I, I, forgive me, Felicia, for saying that, if she's still here. <laughs> um, I think that conventions are big shackles, you know. I, I think there's no greater enemy to good journalism than shackles and these traditions that keep everybody writing in pretty much the same way and delivering the news in pretty much the same way. Um, and once that happens, I ask myself, why is anyone going to read my story if everybody's story sounds just like mine? Um, and so, you know, there are other ways to, uh, to answer those critical questions because they are important questions. Everybody who reads a new story should know why they're reading that story. So why you're writing that story, who it concerns, what happened, when it happened, and where it happened. And um, it, it's sort of a, you know, they're like I said, different ways to give your audience what the audience needs. And so it's a much longer lead, but I'm gonna show you the lead I did for the same story in New Mexico. And it says, Jerome missed Keats last night before he fell asleep on a soiled mattress late on Friday on an empty lot speckled by shards of liquor bottles and discarded syringes. Was the stars that glistened up above. A beautiful thing, he recalled this week, drunk already at 9.30 a.m. <coughs> A cousin lay next to him that night, their bodies worn by the cheap vodka they had shared. It had been a good night, Mr. Esquit said, until he felt a dull pain on the bridge of his nose, a punch by one of the massive assailants that surrounded him. Cowards, Mr. Esquit exclaimed, on Tuesday as he stood by the scene of the crime. The assailants kicked and beat them, Mr. Esquit said, using their hands and whatever else they could find, a metal pipe, wooden sticks, cinder blocks, Mr. Esquites eventually broke free and ran away. His cousin, whose name he said was Al Gorman, and another homeless man he knew only as Cowboy, ended up dead. The police said they had both been disfigured beyond recognition by the, tra by the thrashing, which included having their heads smashed repeatedly with the cinder blocks. Someone directed the officers to a stucco house on the other end of the lot, where a 15-year-old boy came to the door wearing shorts splattered in blood. Later, the boy told detectives that he, his 16-year-old half-brother, and their friend Alex Rios, 18, had taken turns assaulting the man. So I pretty much said the same thing the AP said, but I'm hoping that people would keep on reading the story. Um, I got there a day after it happened, so the AP was there the day the story happened. Uh, so I understand the urgency of putting the news out. So I had that going against me, so to speak. People already know about this crime, but when you hear that people are beaten to death and disfigured uh, by three teenagers, I want to know how that happened. How did that happen? Who was there? Who saw it? What is this place that they were? They were on an empty lot. Well, it wasn't necessarily an empty lot. As you can see, there was a lot of stuff there, and it turned out to be an encampment for a homeless man right in the middle of the city. In fact, I'm going back to Albuquerque Monday to do uh, a long story. I mean, um, some kind of story. Of, I don't know if you've written pictures, audio, a little bit of everything about homeless people in uh, Albuquerque. So, you know, I, um, I, re I read these two leads because I want you guys to understand that conventions kind of box us all in and that's a dangerous, I think it's a dangerous thing. Um, we have a skill, an experience, a background that uh, sets us all apart. Each of us have things that set us apart from, from the other. 
And it's what sets it as a part that gives us these, uh, what I call points of distinction. Um, it's what makes us uh, stand out, be it to a professor who's teaching you, like Annette, the advisor to Erica in the newspaper, or someone you deal with in your classes, whatever they might be, or your editor in your newspaper. Um, you know, people who you come in contact with on the field when you're out interviewing. Um, at the New York Times, the norm is to be uh, white, uh, to be male, to be, I'll change my slide, to be upper middle class, and to have graduated from a prestigious university, if not an Ivy League <coughs> school. Um, so um, things are slowly changing, very, very slowly, but that is still the norm there. Um, I don't check into any of these boxes. Um, I'm a woman, of course. I am not white, clearly. Uh, my father grew up poor, and he went to work when he was 13 years old to help his mother, who had seven children and a paraplegic husband at home. So I didn't grow up with money. And I bet no one of the New York Times has ever heard or can pronounce the name of the university I attended. It is Pontificia Universidade Católica. So <laughs> that, goes, <laughs> that goes really well when people ask me, where'd you go to college? You're going to Brazil, oh, where? And then they immediately change subjects. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm sure you, you've all felt you don't belong, right? I mean, it's sort of like the nature of being a journalist. You always feel like you're an outsider and you don't belong there, and, uh, and for different reasons. Um, but the thing is, what makes journalism what it is, what makes people want to consume our stories, um, is that we don't all have the same writing style. We don't all come from the same place. We don't all have the same history. Uh, we don't all report from the same angle and don't approach uh, the stories in the same way. Um, um, if you take a moment to think about the stories that are the most memorable to you, just take a second and think of the first thing that comes to mind. I bet that you will find that these stories fit exactly this criteria. It's the story that maybe you've heard about or read in different outlets, but there's that one story that stayed with you. It's because it, it was told to you in, in a different way. Um, it was maybe a picture that was special uh, that made you stop and, and look at that person and almost feel the feeling that that person was feeling. Um, or it was, I mean, when, when Eric was talking about the picture of the couple who lost their son, a fire that actually, a fatality that I covered, uh, you were almost choking up and, and I know exactly that feeling of looking at a picture and wanting to cry because you know the emotion that that moment carried and you want readers to, to read your stuff or to um, look at the pictures you took or listen to the audio you recorded or the images you recorded and feel the same way because that is what we're in, on this earth for. That's what, why journalism exists. Um, and uh, a lot of people are very curious about how I got to the New York Times, right, since I don't check any of those boxes. And, uh, and I think it's sort of the perfect moment to talk about it because um, I believe that the New York Times hired me because um, I'm not your typical New York Times reporter. Um, and they had not only recognized that they needed somebody unlike everybody else they had on staff, but that they needed to hire that person really fast. And uh, I don't know. If you're religious, you say by the grace of God, you say the stars aligned, or it was my lucky day, and you know I met a recruiter, and um, and she said to me, "Oh, I've heard your name, and uh, and I think you're really good, but we don't know if you can write." And the reason was that I worked at the Daily News in New York at the time, and for those of you who know, the Daily News is a tabloid newspaper, so the stories are much shorter, punchier, now even more, even uh, more colloquial, I would say, than they were back then, but a t certainly a very different style than the times. And so uh, I said, you know, well, I got to figure out a way to prove to this, to this woman that I can write. And uh, I was married at the time, and I'll get to that really quickly, but um, um, it wasn't fair to take my husband out of New York. I already had taken him out of Massachusetts where he's from. And um, uh, I said, well, if I find a fellowship that allows me to go abroad and do something that I wanted to do <coughs> and won't take a long time so my husband won't divorce me, um, <laughs> then I can go, report, write some stories, come back and show this lady from the New York Times that I can actually write nice stories about stuff. Um, and I had been <coughs> obsessed at the time about the 50% uh, decline in violent crime in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I was intrigued because I grew up in Rio de Janeiro, uh, 
a city with very high crime rate, and I couldn't understand why Bogota could get it together and, and cut down the number of violent crimes by 50% and my city couldn't. So um, I ended up getting a fellowship with the International Reporting Project, which is uh, used to be known as Pew Fellowship. It's hosted by the, it's a long name, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced and International Studies uh, at, um, in Washington, and, uh, and I went to Columbia. And I was told that they actually picked me because they couldn't believe that the story that I wanted to report on was true. So they wanted me to go and find out, and I knew it was true. So, you know, uh, it was great. And I came back and, you know, I started talking to the Times, and I stopped at People Magazine along the way. I was their news reporter. Uh, but I'll tell you a quick thing. They knew I wasn't right for the job. I was on a contract, sort of like ex an experiment for me and for them. When uh, we went to a news meeting and Britney Spears was pregnant for seven months and I had no idea she was even pregnant. So I said, this is just not a place for me. I, I don't follow that kind of news. So anyway, so, you know, as I said, I'm from Brazil. I grew up there. So English is uh, not my first language, nor is Spanish. We speak Portuguese in Brazil. Um, and I came to the United States in 1998 to go to graduate school at Boston University. Um, and my plan at the time was to do really well in school, get my diploma from an American university, go back to Rio and say to O Globo, which, was, uh, which is the largest paper in Rio, and say, hey, hire me. Look, I got a master's degree from an American university. Um, and um, I don't think I knew it at the time, but my instinct was so right. What I was looking for was to have a point of distinction. You know, in Brazil, speaking English is, is great, but it really doesn't help you when you're day-to-day -day reporting because it's not the type of stuff that you use it on the streets. Um, you know, maybe I'm a good writer, but I'm sure there are tons of other, there are, I know for a fact, tons of other great writers in Portuguese there. Um, so I guess I wanted to have something different. And, uh, and my father also, you know, on a personal uh, level, um, had always talked about wanting one day to study in the United States because he was poor, he couldn't do it, so he would always say, I remember <coughs> him saying, one day one of my children are gonna go, is gonna go and study in the United States. He, had, he has this huge fascination by this country and uh, for this country, and I said, being that I'm the oldest and very, very competitive, I was like, I'm gonna be that kid. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was, um, uh, obviously I never went back, um, one of my professors in graduate school told me about this um, visa that foreign students could get, year-long work visa. And I thought, hey, I'm going to get this visa, get a job in an American newsroom, and then I'm going to have a diploma and experience in an American newsroom to kind of try to get a job at a newspaper in Brazil. And um, so I applied for the permit, and then I went to a job fair. There, there were job fairs at the time for journalism. I don't know if they happen much anymore. <laughs> And, um, you know, two things happened at this job fair. One was, I got a job. And two, I met my husband, who interviewed me for a job. It's probably kind of inappropriate, because he had my resume, which had my phone number, and then he called me, and, you know, but, um, but we are still married. I actually told his um, grandmother, who was Irish, who was Irish, I, uh, when I met her the first time, she, I was helping clear the table, and she held my wrist and said, no, you stay here. And then she said, uh, do you have a green card? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, but I actually do love him. So, you know, I'm um, married for love, not for the green card. <laughs> I like honesty, and I, knew, I think she appreciated that because since then, I became her best friend. Um, so, you know, um, I climbed this very classic career ladder in journalism. My first job was at the... Um, the Republican, which is a newspaper in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, from the Republican, I spent about a year there. Um, the person who hired me actually left to work at the New York Times, and I remember when he was leaving, he pulled me aside and he said, you should get the hell out of this place. And so I said, okay. And I started <laughs> looking for a job someplace else. I moved on to the Eagle Tribune, which is in Lawrence, Massachusetts. It's a smaller newspaper but much more respected. Uh, they've won two Pulitzer Prizes. At the time, it was a family-owned newspaper, a great, aggressive, um, small newspaper. And um, I happened to be in New York on 9-11, so I did some work there, met a lot of journalists, and ended up going to the Daily News in New York. And then, as I said, I 
had this kind of circuitous <coughs> route to get to the to the New York Times, um, and uh, you know, I've never been afraid of working hard. And I think that that's one of the things that can be your point of distinction. You know, editors, when they're kind of desperate and there's breaking news, they love a reporter who wants, who's like, I'm there, I'll stay all night, I'll, and I'll do my shift tomorrow too, don't worry about it. And, you know, and I don't know anything about wildfires, but that's all right, I can learn. And, you know, they don't want you to be a problem, they want you to be the solution. And so if you're willing to work hard and if you are a team player, as much as we love our followers and our loves and likes and favorites and this and that, and you know, as much as our bylines are there, it's somebody's name and a story. If you stop to think about it, no story, no picture is produced by one person alone. You may have a great eye for a picture, but if you don't have a good photo editor, they're not going to pick the right picture to put in the paper. And then you're going to be really mad because you're going to know that these 20 other pictures you took were much better. And the same goes for writers. We have editors, copy editors, who my husband actually was a copy editor, so I really great, do love copy editors. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, they are the ones who make our stories better, uh, for the most part. Um, <laughs> sorry, some of them are not very good. Um, so I'm sure you all have your points of distinction, and I'm sharing this story because I really want you guys to remember that it's a waste of time to kind of try to smother who you are. And, um, you know, uh, it sounds really corny, but don't fight who you are. Don't try to be like that guy or that woman who is working next to you. Um, I spent so many years in my career as an immigrant, as a non-native English speaker, trying to be like other people I worked with when I should have known right from the beginning that I could never be like them because they grew up in a totally different environment. The way they saw the world was different than mine and their writing was informed by the way they saw the world. So it was really hard for me. I, um, you know, I, I many times contemplated like, why am I doing this to myself? I'm just gonna go back to Brazil. Like, I don't need this horrible life here where I feel judged by everything I do and everywhere I go. Um, and it was, I don't know exactly how it happened, but um, it was certainly at the times where I started to understand that it was exactly the fact that I was different or that I had different things than a lot of my colleagues that made me special. Um, just like each one of you have something that makes you uh, stand out. Um, so focus on your strengths. Don't agonize over your weaknesses because then people are going to really start seeing your weaknesses. And it's not that it's not important for you to know that you have them because <coughs> That's how you improve, right? You know what you have to get better at, then you work at improving. Um, not, uh, but don't let those weaknesses defeat you. Um, use them as a lesson. So here, I'm not a great, see I struggle, for example, with nut graphs. You guys know nut graphs is like that one paragraph that kind of sweeps and brings it all together. And the times, you're talking about these like major nut graphs. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I read some of them sometimes and I go, how the heck were they able to come up with this? I could never do it. And I sometimes I think I sound really smart. I write these nut graphs and they're totally cut out of the story. My editors <laughs> completely change them. And I can never understand why. And I honestly don't know how to write a perfect nut graph for the times, but it's okay. I know how to get to a, uh, an empty lot with a lot of homeless guys and get them to talk to me. So, you know, um, somebody else can write my nut graph for me. <laughs> I do have good editors, so, you know, I'm lucky in that way. Um, so, you know, um, so learn from, from the people who are next to you. Uh, adapt whatever it is that they have that you really like to your uh, abilities. Um, adopt some of the things they do, um, especially or, uh, when it comes to organization. I always look at the way when it's a, a longer story or something I've been reporting over a long period of time. Um, I, I always like to look at the way other reporters who have done that, uh, dealt with the material and organized the material because it's very easy to get lost. Um, I had not even, uh, the book is a whole other thing, but. I had, at the time, several stories that required reporting over a period of time. I constantly am following things that I start this month and six months later I'll write about it. So these systems are really kind of cool to look at the way people, people um, do it. It's like asking your fellow photographers, how do you, what do you do when you cover a wildfire? What are the safety tips that you have? Well, you also have um, you know, tips that you can get from your colleagues on how to organize your notes. And people will give you 20 different 
um, methods and then you can pick the one that suits you best or maybe pick a little bit from one and another and then put it all together and create your own. And, and, and please don't suffocate yourself. Um, so um, I just want to close by saying that rules are really necessary. They're important. They're sort of an obligatory part of journalism. But working under the rules and the conventions of the business should not be your goal. You should not be, your goal should not be to master AP style, okay? If that is your goal, you probably should go home and think about doing something different. Um, and I'm being very honest because it is true. Um, whenever you're tempted to break out of the mold, sweep the five W's aside, bow up the inverted pyramid, report an angle that is not the one that everybody else is reporting, this is really important. Um, whenever you're tempted to report an angle that nobody else is reporting, do it. Because chances are that that's the story that people are going to remember and that's the story they're going to want to read. I'm not saying go rogue and do something totally <laughs> crazy, but but look at the story, take a moment, take a deep breath, and look at the story before your eyes. Look at what's obvious, because that's what everybody else is going to be looking at. And then try to find something, a different way into the story, like I did with the homeless guys. There was a homeless man who was there. Once I found him, I said, I don't have to write what the police told me. I knew from what the police told me that this man was telling me the truth. And um, I knew from his injury that he was there, and I knew from the description he gave me and the place he took me that he knew exactly what had happened and where it had happened. In fact, the stucco house that he pointed to me was indeed the house where the boy lived. I never was able to get in, but, you know, um, I knew he was telling the truth. And so, you know, that's exactly what led me to uh, write my book. And I'm just going to put a picture of these guys up here because I want you all to see them. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, I believe that it has really paid off in a, a much bigger way than what I imagined it would. When uh, these 19 firefighters died while battling the uh, Yarnell Hill fire, they were 19 men from the same crew of wildland firefighters, uh, the Granite Mountain Hotshots. Reporters and editors seemed mostly concerned about assigning blame. Everybody wanted to know who sent them down the mountain, who killed these guys. Why would they ever go down from the black, an area that the fire had already burned, so presumably the safest place in a, in a wildfire area, um, and go down a canyon that was full of unburned brush uh, into a funnel, essentially, um, and, uh, and, and, and basically put their lives at risk. Um, and, you know, my curiosity was more centered on a different question. Why did none of these guys run? I mean, they were found in a space that was about 20 feet by 30 feet. They were very close together. Um, if they were really all young, which they were, strong, which they seemed to be, ambitious, as many people had described them to me, um, why did they choose to stay together? You know, um, what kind of bond is that that they had that I had never experienced? I don't know if I would, if I were part of a team. But maybe I would, I don't know, you know? I, I sometimes think about my friends, my reporter friends that I work with together all the time. Would I stay and try to create a safety zone and cut the brush around me and try to survive a fire with them? Or would I keep running because I got a husband and a daughter at home and I want to go back to them, you know? And so I, I'm sure they didn't take a vote and say, hey, who stays, who goes? It's sort of like, it was implied, you know? We're, we're, they used to say we're only as strong as our weakest link, which means as in, when you work in groups, your strength is based on the, the weakest person, not the strongest person, because that's the person who you have to bring up, not the person who's gonna bring you down. See, it's a different way of looking at things. And so that is exactly the, um, so, so, so to answer this question, I had to learn about each of these guys. I had to add all of their families, many of their friends. I took the firefighting class. I traveled five states, I recorded more than almost 200 hours of interviews. I, I really, um, eight months of my life, I wrote this book from a room at ASU, um, at Cronkite, um, and uh, I only would see my, I said I worked the creation schedule from Monday through Saturday on Sunday I rested. I would go home and see my daughter Sunday. I didn't worry about anything. We would just have a good time, and then Monday I went back to my cave and I was just right. And um, I had their pictures all around and so forth. And, you know, um, I wanted to understand the culture of loyalty that they shared more than anything. And I think that once I understood that, uh, the word blame took a different meaning. Um, 
that there were, uh, tragedy that was so excessively covered by reporters all over the world. Uh, and I was able to uh, come at it, I think, from a way that most other reporters didn't even try uh, to get to. So, um, so I'll leave you at that. And you know, I guess we'll take questions at some point. But thank you so much. It's great to be here. Oh, that's so, so nice! <laughs>